Hello, my name is Greg Rogers with IPM Computers. Welcome to my channel. Today, I would like to be able to discuss an Enable product called Cove Backup. It is a product that we have used for a number of years now, pretty much since the first day that they brought it on board. Uh, we have a requirement that every single client is to use this product because as a uh, cybersecurity company, we like to be able to have a good, strong disaster recovery solution for whenever something happens. One of the things that I love about this product is the flexibility of what you can do with this product. Uh, we utilize a lot of the API functions, and so we tie this product into our Hoodoo documentation system, and we also tie it into our Autotask PSA system. And one of the useful things that we do with that is we have an ability to assign a password on a 24-hour rotation for each and every single device. And what that password does is when you go to load up the UI to even get to the backup dashboard, you have to know that password. So if a uh, hacker or somebody who isn't supposed to have access to that machine somehow gains console level access to that machine, then they won't be able to go in and make any changes to that system's backup. So today, one of the things I'd like to be able to talk about is how do you go through the process of setting up and using this system? So we're going to walk through and actually go through the installation process of being able to get a device backed up and go through the process of actually backing up that system and not only backing up, but also destroying and recreating that system from a bare metal restore. So let's go ahead and hop on in right here. I've got several virtual machines up and running right now. And the one that you are seeing right now is a uh, just the system that does not currently have the backup system on it right now. We are currently logged into my dashboard, which this dashboard is the new beta dashboard. Um, I actually am starting to uh, like it more and more when I use it. It's, it's kind of growing on me. Um, you're able to see every detail you possibly can about the system, um, whether the status is completed, if it had any errors, when was the last successful backup session, uh, what product it's currently using, they actually have a number of different products that you can create with this with, within this system to be able to offer to your clients. Um, you could have 30-day retention. You could have 180-day retention. You can have um, just all sorts of different options that are in there. Uh, we kind of give the uh, a la carte, the all-you-can-eat uh, to our clients because we want them to be able to have all the features that this product offers. Um, so in order to go ahead and get started, uh, we're, we already have a customer created called Test Lab. And so we want to add a Windows desktop device to be able to get backed up. So we're going to click here where it says Add Device. And it's going to give us two options here. Now, they do have the ability to back up Office 365 accounts. Um, it does back up pretty much everything except for Teams right now. I'm hoping that that will be coming soon. And I'm hoping that G Suite backup might be a possibility in the future as well, but for now it is not. Um, so let's go ahead and focus on backing up servers and workstations. So basically you will choose your customer and if you don't have them already in there, you can choose to add a customer and be able to fill in the blanks there. Um, you choose the name, who the parent customer is, the site level, and you could also choose where you want your data to be stored. Um, you could choose whether you want it in the United States or wherever. Um, actually, as you can see right there, data storage location. Um, so anyways, we already have our customer set up. Um, one of the cool things I love about this system is you can choose to put a customer in trial mode, which means that if you're trying to you know, get a system up and going and you have certain variables you have to work out before that system is cemented in place with the way you want it, you can spin up a trial account and it's not going to bill you for it. That's very helpful for people that want to be able to do test lab scenarios or, you know, cool YouTube videos. So anyways, they also have the ability to do profiles. Uh, we actually don't really utilize profiles because when you create a, a profile, it sticks to that profile and you can't really change anything within it. Um, and we like to have device level customizations instead of customer level or site level. Um, so we, we're going to do no profile here. And then you have the ability to choose whether you want Windows, Linux, or Mac. Um, so we're going to do Windows for now. And so it's pretty straightforward. They give you all the instructions right here. Essentially what you do is you download the installer executable. So let's go ahead and download that. 
And just to give some feedback on speed, we're actually on a 500 by 12 coax internet connection here. Um, so anyways, once that file is downloaded, it already has several predetermined settings within that file, so do not rename it. Um, as it says right there, do not change the installation package name and it tells you why. Um, so essentially, we're just going to go ahead and run that download. Uh, let's see here. So what happens is, is when you double click on the installation file, it'll ask for permission. And that is the only prompt you will get. There are no installation next, next, next. Um, there's no progress. It's simply just installing the service on the back end, downloading the files that it needs. And most of the time, it usually runs a uh, web UI. It'll pop up a web browser and allow you to start beginning the setup from there. Some systems, I've had to go in and actually look for the program. So if I go under All Apps, I'm going to look for Backup Manager. And so I'm going to click on that. And once again, it's going to ask me for permission. And you see how quickly this thing is installed. It is very quick. Um, it's going to go through and initialize the config.ini, and it's going to initialize the service settings and all of that. One of the things that I love about this setup is that it has saved our butts in so many ways. Uh, we actually just utilized it the other day to completely revamp a two terabyte uh, data store. Uh, essentially, a previous IT guy had set up a SAN and utilized every letter in the alphabet for every shared drive. <laughs> All right, so we have the uh, backup program up and running here. As you can see, it's got the backup history here and nothing has been backed up. I love this view the way it does it. It shows it in a typical calendar view and it fills these in with the different colors related to the status of the backup. So anyways, we're gonna go ahead and do a backup. And so I'm gonna click here on the backup tab. And these are the different choices that you have to be able to back up from. So you can back up the entire folder structure, the system state. You can even back up network shares from like a SAN or a NAS, like a, a Synology perhaps. Um, if you have any VMware installed on this system, you can be able to back up VMware as well, um, Oracle as well. We don't ever do anything with Oracle, so I really don't even play in that. Um, so anyways, we're going to go ahead and do uh, files and folders. Now, you have the ability to back up the entire file system. Now, be aware of this. If you choose to check this checkbox and later on the client decides to plug in a, a external usb drive like a four terabyte external drive that has four terabytes of data it will start backing that up so we never actually hit this checkbox ever and instead we will choose the drive level that we want to back up so we're going to back up the entire c drive because eventually we want to do a bare metal restoration from this in the event that the entire server burns to the ground so we're going to go ahead and check that hit save and not only that, but we're also going to need the system state as well. So we're going to click on add for the system state. And we're going to choose to check this right here. And then we're going to hit save. And you have to hit it twice for some reason. It's always been like that. I don't know why. <laughs> Once that is done, you can click on run backup and it will begin backing up the program. For now, though, I want to go in and talk about the preferences. So in here, you have the ability to schedule when you want the backups to happen. And like I said, we can do them as frequently as every hour. I've actually got one machine that backs up every five minutes of the day um, just to showcase the fact that it can be that frequent and you can restore to that level of detail if you would like. Um, the use case scenario real world wise, um, there's probably very few limited use cases that you would ever actually want to have that. Um, you can also run various scripts uh, before and after the backup process. Uh, we don't ever use the, uh, the proxy, uh, so I'm not, not actually too familiar with that. Um, the performance, though, we do use that on every single setup that we can. And the reason for that is, is if for whatever reason a backup is missed, let's just say it's a laptop for a user, and they like to turn their laptop off at night, uh, which we advise all of our clients, leave your computers on all the time for 
after hours purposes like running antiviruses is running backups and so forth uh, but anyways this will give you the ability to throttle the amount of bandwidth that it's using when it's doing a backup and so we can go in here and choose to limit the bandwidth we can turn it on let's just say at eight o'clock in the morning right before the office opens up and everybody begins to work and then let's just say everybody is done at five o'clock in the day which like everybody wishes we can be right out the door at five o'clock <laughs> and that is when the throttle will turn off and then from here we can choose you know how much upload speed and how much download speed do we want to give to that system during that throttling process so let's just say you want to cut it down where they can only use 32 kilobytes per second you can do that um, you can have it so that it won't limit on the weekends during those times because they're not working so anyways um from there you can hit save and then also they have this cool little feature here called the local speed vault this what we do with this is essentially we will take a usb external hard drive and in the case of like servers we'll just plug in a, a three or four terabyte usb external hard drive and we will assign the local speed vault the drive letter of that external hard drive what this does is this stores as much of the content as possible locally on that external hard drive so in the case of let's just say you have a client that has poor internet like dsl for example that has maybe one meg of download speed this would be a perfect use case for that client where they would be able to pull that data whenever they needed to from that local speed vault in order to do an emergency restoration of whatever you needed bare metal restoration uh, deleted file whatever it is we have the archiving function function uh, we do this for our clients as well um, so we have the ability to you know archive let's just say once every six months or once every year uh, typically we do about once every year uh, the reason why is because we already keep 180 days of retention of all of our entire clients files so to be able to do this every six months or every month is severe overkill uh, but anyways yeah you can do it as frequently as you would like um, in here, they do have the ability to set up filters. So let's just say if you don't want to back up the temporary internet files or any kind of temp files, you can go in here and edit that as well to your liking. Uh, they have the ability to do seeding. So let's just say if you had huge amounts of data that you need to get backed up, you would be able to take a large external hard drive and put it on that machine and be able to do seeding where basically you enable it and it puts it all onto it's essentially similar to the local speed vault but once you're done with that seed you can go to a place that has faster internet and be able to upload that seed that seeded drive to the backup system uh, that's a, a much faster way to get these things done so anyways we're going to go ahead and do the backup process here so i'm going to go ahead and click on uh, run backup now i will tell you this um, there are some customizations you can do within a file called config.ini and but you have to do that before you hit the backup button or before you hit the restore button and the way you can go about doing that is you need to essentially open up notepad as administrator now be aware you do need to stop the backup service before doing this but essentially you would open up the config.ini under C program files backup manager just type it in config I and I and in here you'll be able to edit the general area to have restore download thread counts if I can type equals and essentially you want to do this to what <clears throat> what the system's performance can handle or what the internet connection can handle uh, essentially what it's doing is it's assigning every core or a certain amount of cores in that system to be able to download the data that it needs in order to be able to restore or back up or whatever and then they've also got synchronization red count and in here i do 10 and then they've got backup threads count equals 10 
And essentially, I went ahead and saved it. But that change will not take until you bat that you start and stop the backup service. And so this whole system is running under this service right here, the backup service controller. And so essentially, you would want to restart that service. For the sake of this demo, we're not going to go through all that, but that's just a very helpful hint. If for whatever reason you're in a bind, you got to get a very quick backup done, or you got to get a very quick restoration done. Um, you never know, especially when a server has died and you're on pins and needles and you just got to get that server back up and going. That is a great helpful tip. So anyways, we're going to go ahead and uh, time lapse this and get to the next VM that already has the backup completed. And that way I can show you what that backup looks like. Okay, so now we're going to go over the uh, restoration process, uh, being able to restore from a, uh, a machine that has been essentially burned to the ground, as you would say. Um, so what we have done is we have downloaded the uh, bare metal recovery ISO, and we have essentially loaded it into the VM. And so once you load the ISO to boot, it's essentially a Windows PE environment. Once you boot up, you get all these various choices. And one of the cool things I love about this system is that uh, if you wanted to, you could start the VNC service, which is option number 10. And if you had to be on the go or had to get away from this machine for whatever reason, you could use another machine on the network to be able to do VNC directly into this um, to be able to do that bare metal restore. Uh, there are a number of ways that you can handle management of this restore process without having to tie yourself physically to this machine for hours at a time or even sometimes days at a time, uh, especially if it's several terabytes in size. Um, but the first step I like to do when I get into a restoration is I want to make sure it can connect to the Internet. So I'm going to hit option four. And so right there we see that we can ping. Uh, to the cloud backup dot management. So we know it has an internet connection and it should be able to connect and get the data that it needs. Um, one of the uh, next steps that I like to do is uh, essentially start a, a command prompt here with option seven. And so I'm gonna actually navigate to that config.ini that we had mentioned earlier and add those variables that we had spoken about before. Um, so let's see. So right now at this point, the service has actually not started. So we can go ahead and edit this config.ini with those variables and be able to um, do a restoration faster. There we go. So as I mentioned before, doing the restore thread count, the backup thread count, synchronization thread count, that essentially assigns an extra thread on the CPU to be able to download more data faster. And this will fully utilize your internet connection. Whereas if you don't do these, it's going to use a logic to be able to do, uh, do the restore or the backup as fast as it can without hogging the entire machine to be able to do it or without hogging the entire internet connection to be able to do it. Um, this essentially is a way to force it to go as fast as possible. So we're gonna go ahead and save that. Uh, the next step that you wanna do, and anytime you call support for help, this is gonna be one of the first things they tell you to do, is to list the, uh, go into disk part, list the disk, list the partitions, make sure that that structure is exactly the way it needs to be. So we're gonna list the disk, and right now we're doing an A to A uh, backup and restoration. Uh, so this is gonna be a very simple clean cut scenario. But this system tries to find the, the best matching disk uh, to be able to restore to. Um, so if you, let's just say you uh, have a bigger hard drive, um, you should be able to restore to that. And what it'll do is it'll create a partition that's exactly the same file size and go ahead and restore to that. But if you try and restore to a disk that's smaller, uh, there's a lot more steps that are involved and it's a lot more complex of a situation to be able to make that happen. Uh, but anyways, so we're doing an A to A uh, restoration here. I'm not doing a differentiating uh, bare metal restore to different hardware or anything of that nature. This product is capable of doing that, um, and it does it very well. Um, but yeah, so let's go ahead and go to the next step. So we want to list the disk. Um, essentially, we want to clean the disk. 
Um, we're going to list the uh, partition, make sure there's no partitions, but we still want to clean the disk. Um, select disk zero, clean. So now we have cleaned the disk and we have a good starting point to be able to do this restoration. So at this point now, I'm going to go ahead and launch the backup manager with option zero. Now, at that prompt, you have the ability to load extra network drivers if for whatever reason your network adapter is not working and you're not able to ping the internet. Um, but here will be perfectly fine. So um, select your language. I'm going to go ahead and hit next. Um, now you have the device name and the installation key of that device that you want to select that you're restoring to this VM or to this machine. So I'm going to go back to my portal here, to my management portal, and I'm going to click on the machine that I want to restore. All of this information can be found in the settings tab here. So I'm going to choose the device name. I'm going to copy and paste it. I'm going to choose the installation key. Once again, I'm going to copy and paste this. And we're going to hit next. Now, this next piece of information that they're asking for is referred to as the encryption key. Um, they have another method of installing an agent, installing a, a backup device where it does not uh, predetermine this key for you. It actually asks you to set it manually. Now, if you choose that method and you forget that key, you can forget that data. That data is gone. Um, there are some other scenarios where if you back up the config.ini, um, you're essentially backing up that key as well. Uh, take that with a grain of salt. You back up that config.ini, um, and that config.ini goes places where you don't want it to go, people can get that data. So treat that config.ini uh, like it is a uh, pot of gold. Um, in this method, we have the ability to use security roles across our technicians, our users, and assign a key technician to have the security officer role. And so inside the portal here, we have this button, generate a passphrase. Anybody that's given the security officer role has that ability. So we're gonna click on that. This is the encryption key. So we're gonna copy this to clipboard and we're gonna paste it in here. And this will allow us access to the files inside that backup. So what this is gonna do is this is gonna start up the Windows services. This is gonna start up the web server that hosts all this. It's gonna open the ports needed to be able to gain access to this. Once this system is up and going, this gives you a, another way to be able to remotely do this restoration process. Um, you will actually be able to use your portal here from any computer, and you'll be able to click on the three dots here. And being that I've done this before, I've actually got more than one mini uh, NT option to choose from here, but you'll be able to click on one of these and essentially you'll get the same web UI as you'll get on the machine itself here. So now if you'll notice, it's prompting me for a password. This is the uh, GUI password that we were mentioning earlier that rotates every 24 hours. Um, so my password is simply just the brilliant password of password. And so we're gonna put that in here and unlock this. And this is gonna allow us into the GUI to continue with the rest restoration process. Uh, and if you'll read the fine print here, uh, it actually tells you that it is downloading uh, essentially like the cabinet, um, the, the bookmarks, index, as you will, of uh, all the files that have been backed up that you can choose from to be able to do a restoration process. Um, also, it says right here, the restored computer may not be bootable if the boot order of disks does not match the boot order of the source computer. Access the BIOS re after restore to change the boot order. There are a number of things that can uh, cause the restoration process not to work properly. Um, the boot order is one. Um, if you're going from a GPT disk to an MBR or vice versa, um, that has its own set of tasks that you got to deal with. Um, and that's why if you look back on the, uh, the, the main prompt, the 0 through 10, I believe, they actually had uh, some tools in there to help with that situation. Um, so anyways, we're going to go ahead and uh, move on to the Restore tab here, uh, or actually, no, the Preferences tab. Uh, one thing you want to be aware of is that if you use the local speed vault, you want to make sure that disk is plugged in, um, that it is recognized by the system itself. That's another thing you want to look at under uh, disk part, is you want to make sure that disk is showing up in disk part. 
um, and you want to make sure you know what the drive letter is. And if it does not have a drive letter in this part, you want to assign it a drive letter. Um, so anyways, you'll go here, you'll turn on the speed vault, and you'll browse for that disk. Now, right now, we do not have a speed vault in place because this is only like a 16 gig VM. And so we're just going to simply restore it fully from the internet. Um, but yes, you want to make sure that is configured and set up before you start this restore process. Um, let's see. So then go ahead and click on restore. Now, if you'll notice here, I can choose a different day and I can choose a different time in which I can do my restore from. Uh, this allows me to do bare metal restores from pretty much any point in time that I've ever done a backup. Um, if I want to do just a simple file recovery, I can actually drill down at that point in time down to that individual file and I can do a restore from there. When I click this restore button, if this was not a bare metal restore and it was just uh, on a running Windows machine, it would ask me, where did I want to restore that file to? Now, when you do a file restoration, let's just say you want to uh, restore this desktop.ini file to C colon backslash temp. What it will do is it will create a series of folders underneath C colon backslash temp such as like c colon backslash temp c slash users slash desktop dot ini just to give you an idea of how that folder structure works when you go to do that restoration of a file but anyways we're kind of veering off a little bit off topic here let's uh, let's get back to the task at hand i want to restore this entire machine so i'm going to choose the entire c drive and actually i'm going to choose the newest one and i'm going to choose the entire c drive now you got a few options here. You can choose to do restore only mode on current machine. I always leave this checked because I want to make sure that that machine is not going to start doing backups immediately right after I'm doing the uh, restore mode. And there's also some conflict reasons there that you want to have that option turned on. Um, it all depends on your scenario as to whether you do or don't want that option. But nine out of 10 reasons that I would want to have it on, I, I mean, scenarios that I get into, I would want to have it on. Um, you always want to create only the volumes that are selected for restore, especially if there's multiple drives that are involved in the scenario. Um, this right here, inject additional drivers to the restored system. That's if you're doing the differentiated bare metal restore to completely different hardware. I always leave it on there anyways, just because it, I mean, it doesn't really harm anything for me for what I'm doing, especially for this scenario. Um, so yeah, we're going to go ahead and hit restore here. Yes, I want to overwrite this completely blank drive. And eventually a uh, progress bar will appear here and you'll be able to get an idea of what all is going on uh, for the first sometimes couple of minutes to it could take as long as in about a good 30 minutes it will try and load this uh, storage that it's referring to in this message here once that process has gone through it will actually blaze through as fast as possible to get that data to this machine onto that drive now, if you'll notice here, there's also a button that says show logs here. This is actually taking you to a web page that you can access uh, various in various manners. Um, but this will give you, you know, exact details of what this system is doing down to the uh, you know, exact little step rather than having to look at that progress bar. So if you're very tech savvy and you want to know exactly what's going on, this is the way to do it. And you can simply just, um, you know, Click on that button and it'll give you an updated log throughout the whole process. There you go. So anyways, we're going to go ahead and uh, freeze this video and come back to it once it's completed. And I'll show you what it looks like to go ahead and just boot into that system from that point. All right, so now you've seen what it's like to do a bare metal restore. Now we're going to focus on doing a virtual disaster recovery. In order to do that, we're going to need to download another tool. So you're going to go into your download section inside the portal. You're going to look for recovery console and you're going to download and install that program. Um, like we had mentioned before with editing the config.ini in order to get it to use as many resources as possible to get the job done as fast as possible, you're going to want to navigate to the C program files recovery console directly directory. And in there, you will see a config.ini. 
once again, I've edited with these three variables here and I've saved it. What I did in this instance is I actually went into the services and looked for recovery console and restarted that service after I edited that config.ini. That will take those new settings. So once you have recovery console running with the way you want it, with the settings you want, you're gonna go in here and you're gonna click on add and you're gonna add by device name, installation key and security code. And once again, you're gonna get that information from the dashboard, from the device itself under settings tab. And so I'm gonna copy and paste these settings in here. And it's going to add this device here. I'm going to choose to ignore this because I'm not going to do any continuous restores of any kind. This is just a one-off restoration to get a VM back up and going. All right. And so then I'm going to right click on it and choose launch backup manager. And if you notice the status of this changing, it says it's initializing now. It's starting up that web server on the back end, utilizing this port 58206. All right, and so now we're gonna load up with our GUI password, top secret password of password. The same as the, the uh, instance with the BMR. And then so I'm going to reiterate once again, under preferences, if you do have a local speed vault, you will want to go in here and set up this speed vault. All right. So we're going to click on restore, choose a virtual disaster recovery, and I'm going to choose the newest date that I want to restore from. My recovery target is going to be Hyper-V. And I'm going to call it restored, promoted restored VM. And I'm going to put the default folder path that I have for my VMs. I'm going to choose my switch. The rest of this stuff I'm just going to leave empty. I'm going to choose not to start it because I like to change my settings before I go through and start my VM. Make sure this is selected. And then we're going to hit restore. Yes, we want to overwrite everything because there's really nothing to overwrite. I'm just going to do it for the sake of doing it. And this thing is going to run through and it's going to start its restoration process. And so one way you can tell if this is actually going through the restore process is you can watch the receive and send speeds in here and be able to tell within task manager exactly what the program is doing on the back end. Um, for the first minute or two in this scenario, um, it's just downloading the catalog of where everything is. Um, once it finishes that download, which it looks like it already has, um, it will begin to utilize all or most of the internet speed that is available to this computer and so you'll see it go from about seven megs to about anywhere from 150 to about 500 megs um, i'm on a 500 meg uh, coax internet connection um, when testing with this backup uh, we're able to do this restore in about five to ten minutes um, but for the sake of this video we're going to go ahead and cut it here and go back to it once the restoration has been completed all right, welcome back everybody. Our restore process has completed. And if you'll notice here under Hyper-V, we have our restored VM is in an off state. Um, our progress bar has gone away. Um, so I'm gonna right click on this VM. I'm going to set the memory to eight gigs. Set the processors to eight, just because this CPU has tons of resources that we can just throw at this. And I'm going to go ahead and connect to this and start this VM. And you're going to get to see how fast an A to A restoration can just be up and running. Um, I will say this, that if you do a differential restore, um, the process of booting at this point can be a lot more delayed than what you're going to witness here. Um, because as you'll see right here, it's already done. You're already at the desktop. 
um, differential backups, differential restores. Um, they basically will try and inject drivers into the OS to be able to be able to boot from whatever hardware you have. Um, but this A to A restoration, lightning fast. And if you notice, I've still got my fluffy kitty photos here. I've still got my top secret document right here. Um, so all my files are completely restored. My, uh, this is the background that I had chosen for this particular VM, and it is exactly the way it was, as well as the, um, as well as the uh, pinned icon that I have right here. Um, so yeah, with that being said, uh, thank you for taking the time to watch this. And if you have any questions at all, feel free to reach out to me. Um, you can go to ipmcomputers.com. You can call us at 910-463-4299 if you have any questions at all. Thank you.